Now, Lady and the Tramp was an original story to start with, and as we made the picture and got to know the characters, we kept getting new ideas. It was one of my most favorite films as a child growing up, and so to be part of it, to me, was quite a joy. For me to personally have worked on a sequel to Lady and the Tramp is essentially a dream come true. It's always inspirational to work on a classic, so we really yeah. wanted to maintain and capture the characterizations that they did all those years ago. When I was actually working on the original Lady and the Tramp, I was a trainee. I really was grateful when Jeanine and Daryl asked me to work on Lady and the Tramp 2. The most wonderful thing about it was they weren't retelling the first story. My biggest challenge was maintaining the look of the original Lady and the Tramp. The original Lady and the Tramp was very inspirational, both to myself and all the artists. Lady and the Tramp is a very romantic picture. It inspires me. It's always a challenge to try and emulate that and to really match the quality that they achieved. I want to give you an idea of how we went about making Lady and the Tramp. Well, first, we must find our stars. And being a dog picture, we naturally looked at a lot of dogs. But we finally decided that this little charmer was the perfect choice for Lady, and that this fellow was far and away our best bet to play the tramp. The one thing about Lady and the Tramp that I really love is the character design. The characters in the sequel were first designed, preliminary designs, in America fashioned after the original feature for Lady and the Tramp, a very kind of 50s style. We used a lot of reference material from the original film. We went into archives and got a lot of animation scenes. To be flicking their artwork was just amazing. And we really tried to capture their style and, and the mannerisms in some of their character acting. There's absolutely a character that I connect with in Lady and the Tramp too, and that's Scamp. Scamp is the son of Lady and the Tramp. Scamp is essentially the adolescent Ooh. goof who wishes that he were cool and even sometimes imagines that he is, but he's just hopelessly nice. Pretty good pickings, huh? Scott Wolf is the voice of Scamp, and he was actually my first choice. It's great, Dad. The junkyard dogs have taught me all the tricks. I go wherever I want, do whatever I please. There's a real sincere quality about Scott that is perfect for the character design of Scamp. You know, he looks like a mutt, but He's a handsome little doggy. Yeah, right. <laughs> Get over yourself, house pet. We've got Angel, who is a female lead in the story. She's feminine. The first, uh, the most important thing is to try and keep her looking very appealing. She's so sweet. She's got ponytail ears. But she's also a streetwise dog and a bit of a tomboy. Then you must know this move. Any street dog would. Wow. Alyssa Milano was the perfect, perfect choice. I guess this emotion would be the, the uh, mischievous, eh? I love the three little girls, Colette, Annette, and Danielle, the prissy little sisters. And there's she's almost a, a mixture of both of them. She would have an intellectual reaction. He brought this on himself. Danielle here has got kind of wild hair. <laughs> she's a little bit crazy. Completely reactive. Serves him right! The Colette is... She's kind of like the princess. And hers would just be how it affects her. Now we'll need another bath. I had an older brother who used to pick on me a lot, and I was that little prissy little sister, so <laughs> can definitely identify with the girls. I bet he gets a slipper right across his great big fat. <laughs> we really do miss him, Mom. The junkyard dogs are a good laugh. They all look up to Buster, I guess, more from fear than anything else. That's right, boys. Junkyard dogs rule this town. <laughs> and Buster rules the junkyard dogs. <laughs> Buster's the villain, but he also has to be admirable. He's kind of a bit of a bully. He's a big, he's like a cross between a Rottweiler and a, a Doberman. In terms of design, you start adding some angles to his face and his ears and his eyes and the way he holds himself. And you get a character who's sharp. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Sleek, muscular, and has all those qualities that you're looking for. So, any of you other low-life mongrels think you're dog enough to take Buster on? Don't be afraid! Have no fear! Have no fear! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> now we have to get a story for them. Now at our studio, we don't write our stories. We draw them. 
What we tried to do was to really stay true to the original story. No one does a story better than Disney. One of the issues that came up was where does Buster come from? So we wanted to create a believable backstory. He says you walked out on him. After I met your mother, I guess Buster just got jealous. You ditch me! Well, if you don't have a good story, you don't have anything. I need to be wild and free. And I'll never find that here. I'd give anything to have what you have. And I'd give anything to have what you have. A tramp has a boy, Scamp, and Scamp gets involved with these uh, junkyard dogs. Come on, kid. You don't know what he's really like, son. And it's about the, the pulling between, you know, going back home and being out on the streets. I feel as though I went through very similar things in my life that Scamp is going through in the movie. I'm not you, Dad. I'm a junkyard dog. You have to have humor. <laughs> a good laugh. You've got your own style, don't you, Tenderfoot? And a good cry. Dad was right. Buster's nothing but trouble. I wish I was home. And uh, sympathy for the characters, moral to the story is always good. The theme of our show is truly about family. About the, the value of family. We want our independence and we want to be our own people and we kind of stray from family a little bit and then ultimately I think we all bounce back. Pop? Son. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have run away. <laughs> The next phase of putting it on film takes us to the director's unit. It is the director's job to coordinate all phases in the making of the picture. It's directed in both LA and Sydney at separate times. LA have got a certain role to do to prepare all the pre-production. It's their responsibility to really make sure the story's working and all the visuals are telling the story in the script. When a story gets locked in and a character's arc is really defined, then that character is alive for me at that point. And once they're really happy with where they've got the script, they start producing visual storyboards. And throughout the storyboarding process, I can imagine the movie in my head. We have character leads from Australia that come out here and work with us in the pre-production phase. And they help to take our characters from when they've been designed, and they start to give them the animatable life. I get the most joy out of seeing the characters come to life. This is Frank Thomas, one of our key animators. He's not just making faces in the mirror for fun. He's mouthing the words as he hears them. Then he sketches the position of his mouth so that the character he's drawing will appear to be saying the words. Well, let's see what we've got here now. By flipping these drawings, at the same time we play the record on the playback machine, we get a pretty fair idea of what we're going to see on the screen. I'll show you. What's a baby? So you see it in pencil What's test animation, baby? and it's that one step further. It's getting closer and closer to what it is that I've always imagined it to be. So weird. How'd you do that? Talent. Let me try. All of a sudden, the character's jumping around and, and talking to another one. It's, it's quite good. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> <laughs> you're weird. Uh, no, you're the weird one. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You have seen how we make the cartoons move and talk. Now, like all actors, they must have backgrounds to work in. These painted backgrounds are the equivalent of the sets used in live action motion pictures. This is going to be the background for the scene where Tramp talks the beaver into removing Lady's muzzle. One of the outstanding things about the original film, Lady and the Tramp, to me, is just how beautiful that world is that they live in. So that was a challenge for us to try and recreate that world. One of the things that we did was go back to the archives where all the original artwork is kept. It really helped lift the quality up across the board. Some of the scenes that you'll see in the sequel are exactly the same location and the same layout as in the first film. It's just a spectacular layout. Tramp? builds a bridge between the two films. Finally, they go before the cameras where they are photographed in CinemaScope and in color. Because we have technology that didn't exist back in the 50s, we were able to recreate wallpaper patterns, rug patterns very simply. It's just 
an astounding thing to look at the original Lady and the Tramp knowing that they didn't do that with a single computer. Nowadays, you know, computers play such a huge part in production, all the way from the digital editing through to compositing the scenes. There are tools for the animator to use, but it's still the basic animator that puts into that film what you see. The original film and the sequel do share some common elements. We do pay homage to the original in many different ways. One of my strongest memories as a kid from the original film is when Lady goes up the stairs and there's that stained glass window behind her. I can just feel the heat coming off that sunlit window. And so I knew that I wanted to stage a scene somewhere in this film to kind of nod to the scene that had such an impact on me that was so magical to me in the first film and now I have it in this one. That dog pound truck that got in the accident now is at the top of the junk pile. And there's the alleyway sequence. We actually reused that alley. Whoa, 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 hey, slow down there, whirlwind. I'm not going home. You can't make me. I know, I know, easy. One day when the picture was well underway, Peggy and Sonny brought us a number that we hadn't expected. It was called, He's a Tramp. What a dog. Music is always a very important thing in a Disney film. And in this film, one of the things that we wanted to do was remember that classic Disney sound. There's more now than just running free. I never felt the approach to our songs in the sequel were to try to capture as much as we could of the original feature. The songs in Lady and the Tramp 2 are written by Grammy Award winner Melissa Manchester and Oscar winner Norman Gimbel. The prologue, um, also known as Welcome Home, actually musicalizes the opening scene, which sets up the story on that turn of the century, Victorian The time, the place, town. the texture, the color. Right, it's the preparation for a July 4th picnic. It's Independence Day song. It's really symbolic of what the film actually is about with regards to Scamp wanting his own independence. So there's a real message in there. My favorite song is a song called Always There. The whole point of the film is that no matter what you do in your life, your family will always be there for you. Always there, shelter from the rain. My favorite song in the sequel is First Junkyard Society Rag. Down in the junkyard. Check out the junkyard, doing the junkyard, society rag. Spaghetti. 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 I mean, who can forget when he rolls the meatball to her? Oh. Oh, yes. Yes, the spaghetti scene. Another tough act to follow for us. It was a re reaction of two people together. And of course, the business of having one strand of spaghetti which pulls them together. I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to think about being compared to it. It's neat and tidy, and particularly lady had to be very ladylike. If I have to do a spaghetti scene, what can I do to it to make it fresh? The crowning thing was pushing that last little meatball over to her, and the look in her eyes just, just sparkled and you know, it's that puppy love thing. So they end up at uh, Tony's restaurant. It was capturing the emotion of the original story and there was almost an expectation, I think, from the audience, which we wanted, we wanted to set up. We decided to go kind of in a, in a totally different direction. For both the characters to just go crazy. They're puppies. Totally hoe into the, the spaghetti. You know that I could feel this. way to deal with the scene was to have fun with it. Now, Lady and the Tramp has really been a fun picture to make. I remember another picture as being fun to make. That was Dumbo. Now, Lady and the Tramp has that same quality. Lady and the Tramp 2 is like working on the first film. I get to visit those characters again. I get to have them interact in new ways. Your old man's got twice the speed and cunning as any dog half his age. <laughs> oh. 
and bring the next generation forward. Have I ever told you girls about the time I saved your father from certain death? Yeah. And still keep the integrity of the first film. It's difficult to live up to a classic. To make it look as good and make the story as good, uh, that's a challenge, but it was met. I grew up loving Disney films. I consider myself uh, very lucky to be part of the, the Disney magic. And I'm thrilled to be able to add to that tradition. <laughs>